Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is John Harkins. I am the Events Associate for the French American Chamber of Commerce, New York Chapter, and we are happy to welcome you to our webinar today, Winning at Digital Through Behavioral Science and Nudge Theory. Uh, just a very quick word about the FACC. The French American Chamber of Commerce's mission is to provide the opportunities, experiences, and understanding that empower successful business relationships between and for members. The FACC New York chapter counts a mosaic of 1,000 members representing sectors from tech to food, finance, and other professional services. These members have complimentary access to digital events featuring top industry experts and leaders, as well as personalized member-to-member -member introductions, access to the FACC member directory, and of course, we'll be able to connect with other, other member attendees of this webinar. Uh, now, this webinar will last about 45 minutes or so, uh, with time for Q&A at the end. And of course, the, it will be recorded and available to all attendees, so don't worry about missing a thing. Um, just a bit about our topic and speakers today. Nowadays, understanding how to navigate and activate your customers or clients effectively all comes down to the digital strategy. We will be joined by Anne Lohr de Borgia of PRS and Vivo and Dr. John Burkhart of BVA Nudge Unit, who will pinpoint exactly how behavioral science can positively impact your customer's experience. Um, Anne Lohr de Borgia leads the global luxury practice of PRS and Vivo. She has 17 years of client experience in project management, having worked both in Paris and New York. Her background is in behavioral and happiness sciences, leveraged to accompany brands in understanding the authentic behaviors of their customers and delivering more emotional experiences. Dr. John Burkhart is a neuroscientist and behavioral scientist uh, specializing in competitive behavioral change. John is a senior advisor at BVA Nudge Unit, a global consultancy and pioneer in applying behavioral science to support organizations, governments, and NGOs in creating successful behavioral change. I won't keep us all waiting any longer. Uh, so Anne Laura and John, would you like to take it away? Yes, sure, thank you very much, John. Um, let's get started. There we go. And Laura, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, well, thank you uh, very much uh, to the French American uh, Chamber of Commerce for having us. Uh, we're happy to, to share uh, our uh, experience uh, with uh, using uh, behavioral science and nudge for uh, business uh, purpose. Um, first, so um, John has already uh, introduced us, so perhaps we can uh, go straight uh, in the core of the topic. Um, so our job at PRS in Vivo is really to connect with consumers' motivations and behaviors. It's really at the heart of our job. And so during the lockdown period, we decided to stay connected with customers and also uh, with brands to really stay in touch with uh, people's authentic uh, behaviors, even if we were no longer able to actually uh, connect with them in person. So we ran uh, several studies and projects uh, during this uh, particular period to really understand the changes in behaviors uh, during this, uh, this time. And what we, uh, we've observed is a tension for both uh, customers and uh, brands and businesses. Uh, first, for customers, what we saw is um, an acceleration in the establishment of new behaviors. But at the same time, uh, habits have not yet been fully created and all needs are not met. So we are still in uh, the middle of the road um, and it's a tension uh, perceived by customers. For businesses, there is also a need to navigate uh, this new normal with an accelerated speed, which means also uh, an increase in the risk to jeopardize the quality of the customer experience. So in this time of tension uh, that we've really uh, observed, We've also, uh, we would like to share three uh, behaviors uh, that are coming from this new, uh, from this new period. So, and, and we decided, we wanted to share those three behaviors because we believe that they would impact the way we think about digital experience. So the first one is uh, uh, more like, it's a contextual 
uh, behaviors. Um, there has been a disruption in our everyday life, which uh, actually is a kind of tangible also in, uh, if we look at the Google report about the mobility, we really see a drop in our mobility uh, during uh, this lockdown. And this has resulted in a functional adaptation for all of us uh, with a search of reduced, um, for reduced uncertainty. And so we had to really adapt and we, we are still trying to reduce uncertainty even more than before. The second uh, change in behavior is more emotional. Uh, we all have experienced this kind of emotional roller coaster during the lockdown and it has resulted in a blooming of personal creativity, uh, which is still going on today. Um, this blooming creativity, personal creativity was in terms of social behaviors, cultural, fashion, beauty. Um, so we've been very creative in, um, during this period. And we've been, uh, us as Curious in Vivo, we've been tracking um, this trend uh, online through a digital ethnography. And finally, the last uh, big change for us uh, was more social. And um, we've seen uh, some changes in social norms with an acceleration in conscious consumptions and a lot of initiatives that you probably know uh, illustrate um, this, new, uh, this new trend, this new behavior. So in the middle, in amongst this kind of a tension that we've presented at the beginning, we've observed these three big uh, pillars of behaviors that we believe are important to uh, keep in mind when we think about designing uh, experience in the future. And actually, if we look at uh, the FACC survey among their members, what we see that uh, you brand, uh, you uh, members are well aware uh, that you will need to navigate this new landscape and that it's going to be a challenge and that among part of this challenge, there will be an increasing focus uh, on digital. So uh, we, the FACC has collected like that a lot of verbatims uh, all going in the same uh, direction. So that's for your perceptions as members of the FACC. If we look at what customers are saying, they are also uh, we, they are also aware that uh, it's not yet perfect. That digital experiences are not yet perfect, and they are going to be uh, very demanding. Um, even we we see even like even for luxury, especially for luxury brand, actually. Um, we've observed uh, very demanding behaviors, uh, showing room for improvement in the quality of the experience. And what we have seen is also customers being a little bit disappointed by their experience with dig digital shopping uh, during the lockdown. So it shows that there is really uh, the brands being uh, well aware that uh, there is a priority uh, going to the to digital um, experience and clients, they want to go more on digital, but they are not yet completely satisfied. So there is a challenge. There is really something to do uh, to improve uh, this experience uh, online. So that's why it's going to, so we are here to uh, actually uh, uh, show you, share with you how behavioral science can be uh, the compass to navigate uh, this, um, this, uh, this particular uh, time. And that's what John is going to share with you. Thank you, Anne-Laure. So the question then presents itself, how do we navigate this world with these new normals around us? Even if COVID-19 were to disappear tomorrow, these new normals are here to stay. They're going to be with us for a very long time. The market has fundamentally changed. There has been disruption that is in response to a transient phenomenon, but because the market has shifted, there will be lasting implications and downstream consequences of this. We don't have a playbook for these. We don't have established best practices for these new normals. So what do we do? How do we go about navigating these? Well, of course, the punchline has already been given away. The answer is with behavioral science. 
Behavioral science is a very popular topic these days. You hear about it in a number of different uh, avenues and different conversations. So what do we mean by behavioral science? A very simple definition would be that behavioral science studies and decodes how people make decisions and how to influence them. Now we say here on this slide that there was 40 years of experimentation, but that's actually just behavioral economics. Behavioral science has been with us for far, far longer than that. Contemporary behavioral science traces its lineage back to Kurt Lewin and Santiago Ramon y Cajal at the start of the 20th century. It's a well-developed, well-established field. It's been confined primarily to the academic sector for a very long time. But in recent years, we've seen a pair of, interestingly, a pair of psychologists, Daniel Kahneman and Richard Thaler, who won Nobel Prizes in economics. So there's this increasing understanding that behavioral science allows us to intervene in things beyond just the laboratory. It allows us to look beyond just the, what did Sigmund Freud mean by this? And actually start thinking about how do we understand the behaviors that are going, around, going on around us? And how can we go about influencing them? So how do we use this? How do we apply this? It's important to point out that behavioral science is not marketing. This is often confused. There's some misconceptions around this. Behavioral science is not about what the message is and what channel to use. Behavioral science and marketing are different fields, but they work very well together. They actually are quite complementary, and a behavioral science team and a marketing team should not in any way feel like their toes are being stepped on. Instead, they should feel like partners towards a, real, a much greater outcome. We use behavioral science to engage these new normal behaviors. And we can do this because while the behaviors and the context have changed, while these are new and, and unprecedented and we don't have a playbook, our brains have not changed. We still have the same brains we had six months ago. We still have the same brains we had 2000 years ago. And we have a really good understanding through behavioral science of how to engage those brains. There are consistent and reliable behavioral levers that we can pull to shift perceptions and to facilitate outcomes. And because of how they are wired into our brains, they're very strong drivers of behavior. Well, what does this mean? What, what does this look like in practice? I have a, a, a simple exercise here for you where I've generated a number sequence right here, just a very simple numerical sequence, and I've used a rule. I, I created a rule, and using this rule, I created this number sequence. Now, if this were an in-person presentation, at this point, I would pick somebody in the audience and ask them, please, can you tell me what the rule is? But that doesn't work especially well in this uh, online venue. So instead, I'll ask everyone, just please look at this for a moment, think on what the rule is, and, and I will confirm or, or refute it in just a moment here. Now, this should be very clear. It's a very simple, very obvious rule, and that rule is, n plus one is greater than n. Now, I imagine basically everybody here concluded that the rule is actually the, the next, that n plus one equals two times n, that you're just doubling it all along the way. But the rule I provided is actually correct, and this is how I created it. But because of the way that our brains seek patterns, because of the way that our brains seek to confirm what we believe as opposed to refute it, I was able to create a decision in your head. This is the very simplest implementation of behavioral economics. This right here, this is a parlor trick. This doesn't have a particular utility in any kind of business practice, but it's illustrative of what we can do and how we go about doing it. By understanding what these rules are, by understanding what these pathways and, and prejudices that our brains hold, we can move behavior in one direction or another. And so, as, we, as I mentioned, these core triggers have remained the same. We have frameworks that we use at BVA Nudge Unit and PRS and Vivo to interact with these triggers. We have the drivers of influence created by our founder, uh, Eric Singler, which is a listing and characterization of specific heuristics that we engage um, in terms of how decisions are made and how behaviors are selected. And we see that particular to the CX side, um, the peak end rule is very, very important in moving behaviors. Peak end rule essentially says that 
the aggregate experience is a function of two things. The peak of the experience, how, how an individual feels during the, the apex of that experience, and how they feel at the conclusion of it. If you have a very high introduction, but then the peak and the end are low, you won't have a very high overall experience. Whereas you can thoroughly botch the intro or something along the way, as long as the peak and the end are both high. And this has a great deal of application across much of CX. As I mentioned, we have this framework, the drivers of influence. Uh, these are 21 different uh, contexts and triggers that are used to understand these behaviors and then create interventions around them. When we want to create an outcome, when we want to create a push a behavior in one direction or another, we turn to these to understand how we go about doing that. We offer instruction on how you can do this yourselves, or we can work with people to go ahead and do this. So what does this look like in practice? What are some actual deployments? So we want to ideally always create a win-win outcome. We don't want to use insidious or nefarious uh, behavioral manipulation. We want to do something that creates a positive outcome for all parties. We have two examples here, one with the, the French tax authority, where they were attempting to drive people to do online income declaration. And there was a great deal of resistance. There was fear. There was uncertainty around it. Nobody wants to botch their taxes. And so a normative pressure campaign was deployed, where we looked at, or not looked at, where we, we deployed uh, messaging and interventions to, to get across the, to those who are reluctant to adapt that this is already being done by other people. See, there is very safe and, 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 and positive outcomes on the result of everybody. And there's no reason to have this fear. This fear is not supported and not justified. And it was quite effective. This was the, the baseline behavior was updated and there was a very substantial increase in the rate of online income declaration. Uh, looking at a government agency on another continent, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration in, in the States, and here we were looking at uh, texting and driving interventions. And we realized that messaging would not work at all because this is this behavior, this texting and driving, is not mediated by information. It's not mediated by a rational decision. It is a, an involuntary um, stimulus response behavior driven by dopamine. So we needed an even stronger stimulus response. And we created a stimulus response campaign to create an association between your text tone and the sound of squealing brakes, between your text tone and the sound of a car crash, between the sound of, of police sirens. And this created a very strong uh, reluctance to answer a text while driving and to respond to one. So these are some very broad, high-level, complex behaviors in, in the public and social space. But these are equally effective, arguably more effective, in the business and commercial space. And Anilor is going to talk a bit about what that looks like. Hi, John. Um, I think we're having some trouble with Ann Laura's connection. Uh, would you mind just uh, quickly filling in while we get her set up? Uh, sure, absolutely. So frictionless experience is a very important element of, of the, the customer journey. Kurt Lewin's field theory, going back to the 1940s, is that, uh, posits that essentially the best way to get somebody to do something is not to increase their drive to do so, but reduce the difficulty in doing so. And so by making a, an experience frictionless, seamless, by making it easier, you can actually get, you have a much stronger way of getting people to do something than to um, offer them incentives. So here with Athleta, we have this uh, give it a workout guarantee. If it doesn't perform, return it for free. Um, and this actually also plays to the principle of reciprocity, that by giving something, you, the, the recipient then feels a sense of, of obligation. They, they feel a sense of indebtedness to the whoever gave them that something. And so here, by making the experience frictionless and easy and engaging this reciprocity, we're able to drive a much higher utilization and much higher uh, rate of sign up in these, uh, um, with, with these uh, potential clients.
We also look at building purpose-driven experience uh, to, to enable conscious consumption. This is a very important topic right now, given, well, it's it's been a growing field of import for um, millennials and Gen Z. And in the last six months, it's become even more important. And in the last three weeks, it's become exponentially more important that people show a sense of social responsibility, a sense of fairness. This plays to these drivers of emotions and fairness, and also we're leveraging this on value. By doing this, we create a very strong sense of, this is a, not just something that I would, on the part of consumer, we create a sense, not just of, this is something that I would like to do, but this is something that is important for me to do. This is something that creates change that we want to see. This is something that supports the core identity that I feel about myself. And by engaging this, by engaging this organization, this company, this product, this outcome, I'm supporting the core conceptualization I have of myself. And this becomes a very powerful way to move and purpose behavior. And this plays to the point that the human is always at the heart of the digital luxury experience. And honestly, we can, we can go even more broad than that. Humans are at the heart of experience, full stop. If we look at them as a consumer, if we look at them as a product, as a commodity, as a revenue stream, we're going to lose. We're going to miss out on optimizing and maximizing that experience for them. So we see here um, that only 14% of luxury shoppers would value chat features on websites to engage with the brand. Uh, this is, I'm sure we've all seen these, these pop-ups, you know, hey, can I, may I help you? Um, and this is the sort of thing that it feels very inauthentic. It feels very bot related, very app related. We all know that these are not actually humans we're interacting with. Um, but here, by having a WhatsApp, we see in a counter example with Harvey Nichols, the, the WhatsApp shop line, where you interact directly with a human, with another person who can relate to you in this human way, you have a much greater ability to interact with people and to leverage and engage their behaviors, to convert it in a positive direction and to make that seamless, positive, socially responsible experience that we want our consumers to have. Now, coming back here to the peak end rule, as I mentioned, I'm sorry, was that on lower coming on? I couldn't hear. So now that we've understood uh, these behaviors and how we make decisions, especially so in this uh, digital uh, environment, uh, what we believe that it is important also to think about the creation of this overall experience uh, using the pick and, and rule and being able to elevate uh, the experience you offer by creating memorable peaks. And our conviction is that those peaks should not be left to the chance. And you have actually the possibility to manage those peaks, to create them as you want to do it. And this is why the, this is the reason why we have been um, using the EPIC, what we call the EPIC framework, structured around four triggers to create a memorable experience. So EPIC, it stands for elevation, going beyond the routine and the expected, the pride, making people feel unique, valued, the insight, which is uh, related to um, uh, learning about a topic of interest, and finally, the connection about creating emotional bond, feeling part of the brand community. So. Uh, if you manage to trigger those four uh, elements, it, you are able to create a memorable uh, moment. So this is really the framework we use for both designing experience and measuring experience as well. So if we look at how uh, EPIC is actually uh, can be activated uh, on the on different uh, kinds of experiences. So first, uh, if we look at um, the pop-up on uh, online, what we see that uh, when brands create pop-up like here on Tmall, it's a way 
to create elevation um, through a spontaneous moment. And so in this case, uh, the digital environment can be a facilitator for epic moment. Um, and here in particular with the elevation uh, going beyond the routine um, by the creation of this spontaneous uh, moment. So that's when you are really uh, on, the, on the web. There is another key moment uh, when you offer a digital uh, experience, which will be about uh, the unboxing uh, moment. And the unboxing moment is really uh, critical uh, for a digital experience because it's not only like a peak, but it's also the true end uh, of the experience. So it's very important to make it memorable. And here it's an example from uh, Le Bon Marché, so the French uh, department store. And uh, when you receive your pack, when you order uh, online on their website, uh, their website 24 Sèvres and 4 Sèvres, you receive your, uh, your package at home and it's a whole experience. You have the elevation through these 3D monuments of Paris and uh, you get different types of, uh, of monuments. You have the pride because you have your initials, uh, your, um, the, the city where you live and so on. Uh, you have the insight because inside the box, you have a letter uh, with a quote uh, by Victor Hugo. And you also have the connection uh, because this letter is handwritten. So it's uh, really like the four triggers are activated to turn uh, this, um, this unboxing moment into a memorable uh, peak. So another uh, example would be to, um, because so here we had like this uh, pop-up uh, online, the unboxing moment, but even when you evaluate kind of an e-service, uh, and here it's an example from L'Oréal. So if you want to evaluate, uh, the, we wanted to evaluate the performance of this e-service using um, the EPIC framework. So I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Color and Co by L'Oréal, but basically, basically it's a service where you can speak uh, with a colorist like uh, instantly. And this colorist will create a personalized kit to make your uh, hair color at home. And it's pretty cool because it's also leveraging these new behaviors around uh, blooming creativity as we have seen uh, earlier. So this service, this e-service exists and we have analyzed uh, all the client feedback about this service. And we uh, analyzed the client feedback using um, the EPIC uh, framework. So if we go on the next slide, you can see how it works. Uh, we have, uh, so we, we look at all the feedbacks about this service, and then we can identify if we are more talking about the pride, about the insight, the, um, the connection, uh, or the elevation. So here is just an example with the two letters, pride, uh, pride and insight. But at the end, if we look at the results, uh, of this uh, evaluation of the e-service, uh, you see that we managed to get a percentage of elevation, pride, insight, and connection to evaluate this, ex this online uh, experience. Here, for example, we have a pretty well uh, balanced profile uh, uh, between elevation, pride, and insight, but clearly we have a room to improve on the feeling of connection to make this experience truly uh, memorable. So this EPIC framework, uh, you see it can be uh, used to design here to evaluate the experience uh, online, but also when you develop the survey you're going to send to your client to get their feedback on their experience. And the idea is that this survey of course will, um, will uh, measure uh, how epic your experience is, but also the survey itself should be an epic experience for the customers, meaning that we also need to have a great start, to have a peak, and especially a peak at the end, 
to make this experience part of the overall uh, brand experience. So uh, the idea of elevation of the experience and using the pick and end rule through the EPIC framework is can really cover a lot of different uh, kind of moments uh, of your um, the experience with your brand. So as a conclusion, uh, for us, there are four steps to remember to lead the way with a digital uh, experience. The first one is really to leverage authentic behaviors and put those uh, at the center of the design. And that's why we always connect uh, with uh, authentic behaviors to start anything we do. Then two, uh, the, we think it's important to employ behavioral science to fuel your priorities. And this, um, it's really a framework you can use uh, by yourself. You need also to activate the human triggers for an impactful change. So to activate the drivers of influence that uh, John uh, shared with you. And finally, uh, it's important to drive memorability for customer engagement using the EPIC framework. So to follow this lead path uh, when thinking about, um, about digital, uh, digital experience. That's the four uh, key things that uh, we'd be happy uh, for you to remember. And of course, also, uh, to, to hear from you, and uh, even now, if you have some questions, feedback, uh, we'll be happy to, to answer. Sure. Well, uh, thank you both, and Laura and John. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, John, you had mentioned that behavioral science and uh, the marketing teams, they're different but um, compatible. Uh, yeah. I'd just like to understand exactly how to better integrate both a marketing team and a behavioral science team, and if you do not have a behavioral science team, how can you better train your marketing team to take this into account? Sure, great question. Um, so in terms of the integration, one of the most important things is to have the behavioral science team and the marketing team in ongoing communication with each other. The behavioral science team ideally understands and, and examines the behavior of the client, the customer, the consumer, but the marketing team is actually the group that's talking to the consumer. And so there needs to be an ongoing dialogue internally of, okay, here's what we have available to us. Here's what we're doing. Okay, that's not going to work, or here's a way we can do this better. But at the same time, the marketing team needs to inform and, and train the behavioral science team as to, okay, this is a great laboratory intervention, but there's really no way we can do this in the real world. This is what our toolbox is. Okay, here's this principle you've taken. Here's how we think we could integrate this into some sort of communications or external messaging or even internal messaging. There needs to be ongoing discussion back and forth between the two of them. Um, and ideally, you'd want them to fall under the same leadership. Um, it makes sense to have them as, as distinct teams, but not really necessarily distinct divisions, um, because ultimately they do have the same goal, which is to influence the behavior of the people who receive the message. In terms of training, that's a um, interesting question. Uh, there, there's a ton of, of information available right now. As I mentioned, this is a very popular uh, topic. Um, most people are at least aware of Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Hopefully, most people have read it. Um, Honestly, there are a number of very good online courses through Coursera and even BVA Nudge Unit, where we have our own uh, training program, that these don't necessarily entail a full academic curriculum, but these are things that can be done in the course of a couple hours a week over the span of six to 12 weeks. And these are things where if you have one or two people on the team who are well-trained, they can then come back and train the rest of the team. Okay. And um, just a, a final question uh, for you, Anne Laura. You had mentioned um, that there were there was an ad which focused on three of the Epic framework um, mentalities, but it didn't um, include the connectivity. Uh, do you have to have all four of those um, categories to consider a in engagement to be um, successful? 
Uh, no, not necessarily. And what's very important actually is to, uh, uh, before using the EPIC framework, even to think about how EPIC apply to your brand. What does elevation mean for your brand? What, how do you translate pride for your brand? And so like that, once you have done this definition, you can actually uh, set your action standard on EPIC and know if you want to push uh, further on elevation, or pride or to know really how you set your priorities. So it's, um, it's important to do kind of this preliminary work to know uh, what is the epic of your brand. And uh, each time I've seen, uh, we've applied it with a brand, uh, uh, we see actually different uh, outcomes depending on the brand uh, purpose uh, in terms of experience. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think that that is where we will end things today, but I would just like to take a very quick moment, John and Laura, thank you so much for spending some time with us, uh, lending some insight to us, uh, the FACC. Um, I would just like to, to the attendees, thank you for coming. Um, and just a quick heads up on the 30th, we have an upcoming webinar um, with Thomas Folsom of Aiming USA, focusing on increasing cash flow through a little known uh, R&D tax credit. Again, Ann, Laura, John, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciated it. Um, and to everyone here, we're looking forward to seeing you soon. Uh, thank you on behalf of the FACC. Have a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.